Happy birthday, dear our church. Happy birthday to you. Hey, my name is Luke, and we are getting ready to celebrate our birthday week in February 26th and 27th. We're throwing a party. Yes, and I'm Janae, and we would love for you to come out and help us celebrate. We have one special request. If you can grab an invite card on your way out, we'd love to have you invite your friends, your friends' friends. Actually, bring the whole city if you like. We just can't wait to see you. See you there. All right. Okay, everybody get your Bibles out. We're in this collection of talks that were, it's entitled... Who is Jesus? And we've been walking through and talking about the Jesus. We, we took images from the scripture, right? We didn't make up who is Jesus. We asked, who does Jesus say he is? And he said he's a door. And he said he's the bread of life. He said these are different things, you know. And today I've asked my friend Moses Masita to come and bring the word. So you get your Bible out, you get your notes out, and we're, we're going to do this together. Moses hails from Johannesburg, South Africa, one of the most beautiful places in the world. I love South Africa, uh, Cape Town, Durban, all those areas over there. But the people of Johannesburg are such beautiful, warm human beings. And uh, just... It's just a gift to me that a few years ago, Moses and I became friends. For a living, he advocates for persecuted followers of Jesus around the world. Every day he gets up. I'm kind of casual about it. I like to, you know, like the Olympics. I, I'm not watching the Olympics this year because I know what the government of China does every day to followers of Jesus. So I just kind of opt out. But Moses does that every day. He's telling the story. He's uh, making a difference uh, in the area of human rights. And I admire that so much. But on a personal level, he's been a good friend to me through good days and bad. And I just love him so much. So would you give a very warm, I said very, very warm welcome to my friend Moses Masita. Come on, Moses. Look at these. Standing ovation. <laughs> Two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's a movement. Uh, good, good morning, church. Um, how are you doing this morning? Oh, it's Super Bowl Sunday, isn't it? Yeah, you, you're going to go home after this, and you're going to make good food, and you're going to watch a good football game, and then you're going to eat a lot, and by the end of the day, you're going to have a foot coma, and it would have been a great, great day, right? Um, I love it. I've been living in this country for 10 years now, and uh, every time Super Bowl Sunday comes along, I just remind myself, uh, like Thanksgiving and Christmas uh, nights, these are the days when I can be as lazy as I want to, and I don't have to talk to anybody. We just watch TV for six hours and eat food. It's, it's a good Sunday. Um, <laughs> I'm really grateful to be here uh, with you guys this afternoon. I told uh, Pastor Dean last night, and in his absence, I'll tell him again here this morning, uh, that it seems like everything good in my life over the past few years has come through the Curry uh, family. And so I just really want to express sincere gratitude to him for the friendship that he has given me and my family. And I also want to wish you guys a happy birthday. Uh, so you'll be three here in a few weeks. Congratulations for that. Uh, happy birthday, our church. Uh, you guys are both an answer to prayer and a blessed people. Uh, I, I, read, I read the book of Malachi the other day, and when I was reading it, the book of Malachi 3.11, I think, and it says that uh, when you have given your tithe, you've done all these great things, the Lord will bless you, he'll open the windows of heaven, and he will do all sorts of good things. And then it concludes by saying, he will make you a delightful nation. Uh, he says all the nations of the world will look at you and call you blessed. And I think that our church 253 is a delightful people. And so congratulations uh, for your third birthday. And thank you so much for having me here uh, today to join this conversation that you have been having 
on who is Jesus. The central question that you're responding to is who is Jesus? And over the past six weeks, you've had a selection of uh, talks that have walked us through all of that. I would like to echo what Dean said. I work for an organization called Open Doors USA. We are at the core of it, a human rights organization, but we add an emphasis as being a faith-based human rights organization on an annual basis. We release a list of the 50 nations in the world where it is most dangerous to be a Christian. These are people who could potentially be thrown in jail, potentially uh, be beaten up, and potentially sometimes, very few occasions it does happen, that they get killed for professing Jesus as Christ. The vast majority of whom are people who are denied mere opportunities. They're denied things like access to jobs, access to COVID medication, access to food supplies because they call Jesus uh, their Lord. And so we serve these people. We advocate on their behalf on a regular basis. The country that is hosting the Winter Olympics this year is number 17 on that list. And now you may say to me, hey Moses, you said you release a list of 50 nations, 17 seems to be pretty low. Uh, the thing with China, though, is that being number 17 uh, on the list of the top 50 nations uh, that is most dangerous to be a Christian is that they also have a supersized influence on other countries. China is probably outside of the United States and very soon will overtake the United States as being the most influential country in the world. And their influence is seen through how they disperse their resources. One of the things that they're sharing with their friends across the world, and we see this in the Middle East, we see this in parts of Africa, is that they are sharing surveillance technology. So what that does is that when people walk into institutions like this, like the church, they have surveillance everywhere where every single person is being monitored. Now, if they suspect for, what, for one reason or the other that you are someone who poses a threat to them, you could either be thrown into jail or be disappeared and your family doesn't know what has happened to you. This is the case with very many people in China right now. So our call for this Winter Olympics is that as best as you can, as much as your conscience allows you to do so, could you please consider boycotting the Olympics by not watching by not paying as much attention as you would normally do. Now, I know that uh, there are a few Washingtonians that are participating, and we love sports, right? Sports are great. We love them. And so I would just say, maybe use your phone to check in on how the scores are happening and so forth, but please just make sure that your money through your digital TV subscriptions and so forth does not go to China. There will be other Olympics, okay? They, they, they will go to countries that, uh, that are acceptable to go to, but let's do as best as we can right now to just boycott caught what is happening over there. Amen? Thank you uh, for that. Uh, like I said, I really am grateful to be invited to join you uh, in this series that you have been on. The question that we're responding to is, who is Jesus? Now, over the past few weeks, you have gone through a select list of the things that Jesus himself said about himself. He said, this is who I am. And I will mention them very briefly here in a moment. But one of the things I love to do, because to understand something or someone, you really have to understand the purpose for which they came. And so we begin by asking, who is Jesus? By first asking, why Jesus? Why did he come on this? earth? Why did he present himself as a person to those who were living in the times that they were living? Because how many of you know that you and I are just not, uh, we are not just a modern expression of, of, of some new religion. We are joining a very old conversation. In fact, when we open the letters and read the scriptures, we are joining a conversation that is at least to our knowledge about 2,000 years old. Now we think it's much older than that. At least the earth could date to about 5,000 since humans began inhabiting the earth and having conversation with God. And so the question that we are really asking here is, what is it that God is doing in relation to the people that he has created to this earth? And to understand that, we begin by answering the question, why did Jesus come to earth? One of my favorite writers of the gospel, there are four gospels, if you, as you know, one of my favorite writers of the gospel is a guy called Luke. Luke is probably one of the most accessible writers of the gospel to me. I read the book of Luke and I see myself, I see my mother, I see my family, I see people who would ordinarily be marginalized. They are being centered in the book of Luke. And he gives us a central tenant for why Jesus came to this earth. 
If you'd be so kind, would you please open your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 4, and let's read together from verses 18 and 19. This is what Jesus, this is what Luke says about Jesus. He says, one day Jesus walked into a sanctuary like this, and he went to the front and opened the scrolls, and he was the one doing the reading of the scripture that day, and the reading so happened to be in the book of Isaiah. And Jesus opened and said this about, this, and read this in the scriptures and said it's about himself. This is what Jesus said. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus, because he has anointed Jesus to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent Jesus to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And my very favorite thought on this, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now imagine that for a second. The question is, why Jesus? And when he opens the scriptures, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for this particular purpose. The Spirit of the Lord has looked upon humanity and he has witnessed certain things. There are people who live impoverished lives. There are people who live in a place of lack. Now that may be physical, material, spiritual, emotional, whatever sense of lack that people found them in. Jesus says, I have recognized and seen that and the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me that I may preach good news to those people. And then secondly, Jesus says that the Spirit of the Lord has also come upon me, having recognized a lot of brokenheartedness in humanity. Every single person that is sitting in this room, I guarantee you right now, when you look through the trajectory of your life, there's a lot of brokenheartedness that you can point to. Now the good news is that Jesus has also seen that. And the scripture says he has come to heal the brokenheartedness that we have experienced. He's a God who sees our pain, and he has come to heal it. And then the third thing that he says is that he has come to proclaim liberty to those who are captive. Now, I mentioned earlier people who find themselves in physical detention for merely calling upon the name of Jesus, but there are very many people that are also captive to the things they have experienced in their past, either things they did or things that were done to them. They're captive to those realities, bound by chains to those things. And Jesus says he has come to set those people at liberty as well. And then he adds to that that he has recognized that there are people who are walking around life blind. In a physical sense, they cannot see. But also in a spiritual sense, they cannot see in the manner that God desires that they would see. So Jesus says he has recognized the scales on people's lives and he has come to give sight again to those who are blind. And then he adds that he has witnessed that those who are oppressed by whatever thing that could be oppressing people. And he had come to proclaim freedom to the people who find themselves oppressed. And he concludes by saying, that this spirit that has come upon him has also come to enable him to pronounce a new normal, what he called the acceptable year of the Lord. One translation calls it the year of the Lord's favor. Another calls it the year of jubilee. In other words, Jesus has come to establish a new way of being for us. He has come to set the standard for what life should be, having recognized the condition that humanity finds itself in, impoverished, captive, oppressed, beaten up. And now he's come to set us at ease again and to give us a life of purpose. And so when we begin to ask the question, who is he? We begin first by looking at his purpose. And in his purpose, we recognize ourselves, we recognize where we were, and now we ask the question, now that we know why you have come, how are we now to live? What does the year of the, uh, of the Lord's acceptable favor look like? 
The book of Romans says to us that you and I are to renew our mind, we are to renew our imaginations, we are to renew our orientations, that we may prove the perfect and acceptable will of the Father, that which C.S. Lewis says to us in mere Christianity, that it's a journey that begins right now, and it's a journey that will continue for the rest of your life, and in fact, Lewis adds, it will continue into eternity. That there are things that you and I will constantly have to grow into, lean into, learn, undo, shed, and let go. And so over the past few weeks, as you have been engaging in this selection of talks, you have heard what he has called himself. You would recall he calls himself the bread of life in the book of John chapter 6. For he is our physical provision. He's also our spiritual provision. You would recall that he called himself the light of the world. He who stands as a guide for those who are looking into the road and are seeing nothing but dimness and darkness. He's a God who gives light to us. And you would remember that he calls himself the door of the sheep. When all doors have been shut, we look to him as the one who opens all arenas of life for us. And he, Jesus, said that he is the resurrection and the life. The dead things in our life come alive again. The things that we have given up on, the things that we have left behind and forgotten about, he brings back to life again. But really, even beyond the now, he's a God who reminds us that there's an eternity where we will have life much more beyond what we have known here. He calls himself the good shepherd. That is an incredible commitment for Jesus to offer himself up to us. He says he is committed to our well-being. He will take care of us. Whatever station of life we find ourselves in, he is a God who has committed himself to taking care of us. You would remember in one instance he said, he is a God who will never leave nor forsake us. We will look to the left, we will look to the right, and everywhere we go, he will constantly be with us. And in one instance, he adds on to that, and he says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. John begins this book by saying that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he says there isn't anything that your eyes can see that was created on this earth that wasn't created without him. John places him at the epicenter of all human existence. Says Jesus was there. And so even in all the analogies that he gives us of himself, John says he was there and he will always be there. And so tonight, today, the concluding thought to a series of talks on who is Jesus. Jesus himself borrows from a metaphor that he would have witnessed on his day-to-day -day life. And in John chapter 15, he calls himself the true vine. Says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. And those, for those of you who are agriculturally oriented, you would recall that really grapevines or vines are good for one thing and one thing only. They exist to help in bearing fruit, nothing else. They're not good for fire, they're not good to build with. If they don't produce fruit, in fact, you throw them away if you don't tend to them. And Jesus borrows that metaphor, and he says, I am the true vine. Can I invite you to read with me John chapter 15 and bear with me? It's a little long here, but let's read together and hear what he says of himself. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is a vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, 
does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. And he goes on to add, as a father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you and that you may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. You are my servant. If you do whatever I command you to do, if you do whatever I command you, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from the Father, I have revealed to you. You did not choose me. But I chose you, appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that you should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. An incredible invitation where Christ places himself as the vine of our lives, and he says he is the true vine. For the purpose that you and I should bear fruit. And Jesus begins by inviting his disciples, by inviting you and I who call ourselves his followers. And he says, hey, be anchored. He says, you remain. Because the storms of life will come. Calamity will come. All sorts of waves will find their way to you and the temptation will be to walk away. And you will worry about your productivity. You will worry about your ability to bear fruit. But he says, remain! For if you are anchored, you will continue to bear fruit. In spite of the calamity, in spite of troubling waters. In spite of the storms of life, you will continue to bear fruit. He says, because my father is a vine dresser. In other words, he is the gardener tending to you. And so in seasons when you are not bearing fruit, the gardener will look at you and he will lift the branches and he will clean them up and he will cut off anything that leads to fruit not yielding. And he will prune the things that leads to fruit yielding. And he will make sure that life continues to flow out of you. And Jesus says, all you got to do to experience that reality is to remain anchored. Abide. And then the second thing that Jesus says to his disciples, he says, stay in communion. Continue to have conversations. Continue to lean in to my word. Continue to lean in to who I am. He says, because everything that I have heard from the Father, I have revealed to you. So we stay anchored, but we also walk in communion. For there's this flow that takes place relationally between us and the God who has determined to take care of us. And the third invitation that Jesus gives us, he says, love one another. In fact, he says, this is my commandment to you. I compel you to do this. Love each other. Stay anchored, be in communion, but now walk in union with one another. It says, prefer each other's well-being. This is how I'm going to call you, my disciples, when you walk in that love. For it's only when you live in that triage of reality that you will continue to bear fruit. And friends, I don't know what arenas of life you are trusting God to continue to bear fruit in. 
It may be family life for you. It may be work. It may be school. It may be your social circles. Whatever arena of life that you're thinking, Christ says you want to bear fruit that lasts to eternity. He says the pathway to do so is to be anchored in the true vine. To be in communion with the true vine. And to listen to his instructions to be in union with one another. For the spirit of the Lord is upon Jesus. Having witnessed the pain of humanity, he has given him tenants to fulfill. And now Jesus tells us who he is. And he says in order for us to continue to bear fruit in life, all we have to do is to stay rooted in who he is. The book of Galatians gives us a glimpse of what vitality looks like in a spiritual life. What the fruits of the Spirit are. And in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, the writer of the book lists the following and he says, uh, for the fruit of the Spirit is love, is joy, is peace, is long-suffering. It's kindness, it's goodness, it's faithfulness, it's gentleness. It's self-control. Then he adds, there's no law against these things. Could you consider, if you and I were to be fruitful in these arenas that he has listed, how much of this will also spill out in other portions of our life? He invites us to stay anchored. He invites us to stay in communion. And he invites us to stay in union. Because Jesus is a true vine. And without him, there's no fruitfulness in our lives. Without him, nothing flows out of us that is life-giving. So today I want to invite you, strengthen what remains. Stand against the tide that may come against you. Know who your God is. Worship him with everything you have. Look to your left, look to your right, see your brother, see your sister, and be on their team. Seek their well-being they too may flourish like we do. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads with me, please? And as you're sitting in this place, reflecting on your own life, seeking to be a fruitful person, maybe you're sitting there thinking, but I'm so far from Jesus. And you would like to know this Jesus that I speak of. The invitation stands today. One of the good news that we read in the scripture is that he's a God who says, I have already cleaned you. You are already clean because I have spoken my word over you. And all you have to do is to respond to that reality. If you're sitting in this place and you say, I don't know Jesus, I would love to know him. With every eye closed and every head bowed, please, so as to not to embarrass anybody. Will you just quickly slip your hand up and put it down as quickly as you put it up? Just put your hand up and say, man, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Just say, I just want to know Jesus. I want to connect with him. Thank you. You can put it down once you've put it up again. Thank you. And Father, I thank you for your people who are reaching out to you to be anchored in who you are. I pray that you will watch over your word to perform it in their lives, that you begin a work that you only will complete. I thank you for the gift of communion, Lord God. And I thank you for the union that they now experience with those that are around them. May your peace dwell with your people forevermore. And may we live a fruitful life as we are anchored in who you are. I pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Would you stand with me, please? Thank you, Moses. Would you thank Moses? Yeah.